Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Deserts, the driest places on Earth, covering more than a fifth of all the world's landmass, as dangerous to life as the highest peak or the coldest glacier. But in these harsh and barren wastelands, nature endures. The people have lived in the desert since the beginning of time. Resilient and resourceful, they have developed unique cultures and deep spiritual bonds with these arid lands. But the modern world of commerce and industry is encroaching on the desert, claiming its resources, changing the delicate balance of life. Now, more than ever, desert people must adapt to survive. This series tells their story of struggle and endeavor, of humanity's continuing relationship with the most challenging places on Earth. One of the most barren and breathtaking landscapes on Earth. Covering more than a million and a half square kilometers, the Gobi is the largest desert in Asia. Vast tracts of which have been barely touched by man. In the summer, temperatures can reach a scorching 40 degrees Celsius. In winter, they fall to 40 below. Surviving here means keeping one step ahead of nature. It also means learning to live and love a landscape that looks to be the most forbidding on Earth. Nowhere else do animals and humans have to depend on each other so completely to survive. But there's change on the horizon. A new Mongolia is emerging. With one eye on untold riches, it's becoming a place of those who stand to gain and those who stand to lose. This is the Gobi, as it may never be seen again. From a distance, the Gobi seems to be one of the most inhospitable places on Earth. But if you look behind the dunes and into the valleys, the Gobi is home to nomadic farmers who, like their forefathers, have farmed the desert for nearly 10,000 years. Nomadic farming is the only life Iditsara Nadilbish and his family have ever known. They know that the key to surviving in the desert is to keep working and keep moving, taking their animals with them. Gorong sering arah utara kat Hawar Jantan pun. 
Wherever they are, every day starts the same way. Once Iditaran's wife Gamma has milked the herd, she prepares a traditional breakfast of seasoned camel milk. The family also keeps goats and sheep for wool and meat. In herders' terms, these animals are just about the same as a pocket full of cash. Just as nomadic families have developed a unique way of life, they've also developed special ways of communing with their creatures. Only a few hours ago, this ewe gave birth to two newborn lambs. Iditsran's family believe this ancient form of singing will stimulate spiritual and physical healing and encourage the lambs to suckle. It's an extraordinary relationship and shows just how much each one depends upon the other. But the family's dependence is heaviest on the most powerful animal they keep. The camel is the only means the farmers have to move their families and homes across the desert. No matter how harsh the weather, the camel always gets them to where they need to be. Keeping the herd healthy is key to the survival of Iditsuran and his family. Sometimes they must leave the animals for days in the search for water. And while the camel looks to be docile, it can also be stubborn. Iditsuran uses a traditional tool to rein it in. And today, the youngest in the herd must undergo a painful rite of passage. <laughs> This ordeal might well have propagated the myth that the camel too can shed a tear. Iditsaran knows the animal's suffering is a necessary evil. Without the nose pin, he would struggle to lead the herd to the very water source that keeps them alive. <laughs> Today, Iditsuran is taking his camels to a waterhole he last visited eight months ago. The camel has an inbuilt early warning system for when it's thirsty. The first sign of dehydration is when its humps become floppy. Although these animals are legendary for being able to withstand desert conditions, they must drink fresh water regularly. And in winter, they depend on Iditsaran to find it. What seems like an ordinary moment is really very precious.
Aiditrin has made sure that his beloved camels will survive, at least for the next 10 days. It means peace of mind for the whole family. Tonight, in their tented home called a Gur, they can relax and watch the news in the company of a rather unusual audience. But there's one family member who's absent. Over 1,400 kilometers away, Iditarin's brother, Biamba, is also relaxing in his Gur, set in a very different landscape. Biamba is one of an increasing number of young Mongolian men who've chosen to turn their back on herding and embrace the life of a miner. Mongolia is being rocked by the biggest resource boom ever seen. And its epicenter is here, 80 kilometers north of the Chinese border at Oyu Toltoi, where mining giant Rio Tinto is building what's predicted to become the third largest gold and copper mine in the world. The Mongolian government has negotiated itself a 34% stake in the project. It believes that this is Mongolia's best chance at lifting itself out of poverty. Vice President of the mine, Sanj Samand, shares this vision. <laughs> Every day, Sanj gets up close and personal with meter after meter of core rock samples. And this is what he's looking for. Deposits of gold, or copper, embedded in the rock. Selective drilling for these samples takes the guesswork out of the search for metal ore. This room is a snapshot of how and where the metal ore is distributed within the rock. By piecing together the data, Sanj constructs a vertical slice of the Earth's layers, showing where the richest seams lie. But to get at it, they must dig deep. And this is where Biamba steps in. He is one of some 10,000 local miners who are working underground to get at these deposits. It's a dangerous and dirty job, but Biamba is embracing the challenge. Today, Biamba is part of a team cutting a tunnel that will give access to the ore deposits underground. When we go down today, we're going to start off with two pipes. You must remember, when doing pipes or any, any work that might have a danger of things falling, danger plate to the bottom. Guys in the bottom adhere to the, the rules towards the danger plate. The main shaft extends more than 1.3 kilometers into the earth. Once the shaft is made safe, the rock will be blasted to expose the ore and mineral-rich debris that's transported to the surface. It's a massive technical achievement. 
and above ground, the construction challenge gets even bigger. When ferocious dust storms and 140 kilometers per hour winds sweep across the desert, the mine's profitability hangs in the balance. For good karma, the mine was opened on an auspicious day in the Buddhist calendar. But making money in the desert calls for more than good luck. Only by mammoth industrial effort can the Gobi be transformed from fruitless terrain to a land of wealth and opportunity. If this mine is profitable, it will more than double Mongolia's GDP in the coming decade. All this change means Biamba is living a vastly altered lifestyle. It's the first time he's ever had so much purchasing power. With a salary of 2,000 US dollars a month, he earns 13 times more than his nomadic brother. He no longer lives on a diet of goat meat. But his social life revolves around his work colleagues rather than his family. It's a massive cultural shift. To soften the blow, the company houses its workers in traditional tented accommodation. But life inside hardly feels like home. Ээлжсэлэгдээд <laughs> What's happening here in the Gobi is indicative of what's happening all over Mongolia. It's predicted that by 2020, Mongolia's GDP will be five times the amount it is today. Increasingly, people are turning away from traditional desert life. As the young embrace their newfound opportunities, the change looks to be irrevocable. This generation may never know what it is to live face to face with the elements. Nowhere is this social transformation brought about by mining more evident than in the capital, Ulaanbaatar. This is the modern face of Mongolia, where more than a million people are city dwellers. Most who live here are enjoying a level of prosperity that just a few years ago would have been unimaginable. But outside the city, life remains a daily battle with the elements. Most people here have nothing to do with big business, though many harbor their own dreams of prospecting the desert's minerals, albeit on a very small scale. In the snowy mountains, six hours drive south of Ulaanbaatar, are three family men hoping to strike it rich. Most days, Otgon Munk and his colleagues travel far from home to explore the disused gold mines that dot the landscape. 
Otgon is just one of tens of thousands of small-time miners who illegally prospect the Gobi. And he has a very personal reason for wanting to unearth something more valuable than piles of grit. Every day it's the same routine. Setting up their poultry equipment for hours of sifting dirt in the hope of finding something that sparkles. The day's work goes from dawn to dusk. <laughs> Even in heavy snow, all the holes are dug by hand. While one man shovels the dirt, the others use metal detectors in a desperate search to pinpoint any grains of gold. If they fail to find anything, there's one last ditch rummage by hand before they admit defeat and strike the next plot of earth. <laughs> Not only is this mining illegal, it's incredibly dangerous. The men must dig as fast as they can before they are discovered by authorities. But they have neither the time nor the energy to reinforce their tunnels. Already they've dug more than four meters down into the soft desert rock. If the tunnel walls collapse, Otgon and his men could suffocate to death in a matter of minutes. With the value of gold almost at an all-time high, safety is something these men are willing to sacrifice. A nugget this size could fetch 280 US dollars on the black market. But today, all Otgon and his team managed to find is a tiny speck of gold. Otgon lives in hope that one day his luck will change. <laughs> Meanwhile, in this desolate landscape, there's only one other means he has to take care of his family, and that's to continue his life as a nomadic herder. In this desert, finding grassland for his herd is often a struggle, but lately it's been getting more and more difficult. Otgon's plan to make enough money to send his daughter offshore for medical treatment is looking increasingly unlikely. These days, he has to travel much further in search of pasture, as it seems like the elements are conspiring against him. Just as it is everywhere else on Earth, Mongolia is getting hotter. But nature here is experiencing more dramatic climate change than the rest of the world. In some places, temperatures have risen more than two degrees Celsius in just 65 years. Frozen springs are melting. Rivers and lakes are drying up. More than two thirds of pasture land is now no longer suitable for grazing. The desert is advancing. In every corner of the Gobi, humans, plants and animals are facing the dire consequences of climate change.
one creature more than any other is clinging to existence. The elusive snow leopard. A solitary, graceful hunter, skilled at traversing rugged, steep terrain. The snow leopard hides out in the icy mountains of Central Asia and the Himalayas. Like the nomadic herders, they are the last of their kind. Here in the South Gobi, there are fewer than a thousand snow leopards left in the wild. Yet incredibly, they are still being voraciously hunted by their one and only predator. Man. And this is what's been happening to this magnificent cat. In the cities of Mongolia, salubrious restaurants continue to use snow leopard fur as decoration. There are at least a hundred pelts lining these walls. And the snow leopard is so precious that nothing goes to waste. Once the pelts have been harvested, their skeletons are sold for traditional Chinese medicine and can be worth 200 US dollars each. Today, snow leopard numbers are in steep decline. But recognizing that the snow leopard is as intrinsic to Mongolia as the snowy mountains themselves, one man is on a mission to save them. As a biologist working with the Snow Leopard Trust, Sunbe Tumasuk is one of the few people on the planet who's had a close encounter with the big cat. On a scientific field trip, his team trapped the creature for tagging. Sunbe got close enough to touch it before releasing it into the wild. <laughs> Sunbe spends most of his time traveling vast distances talking to herders who share the same inhospitable terrain as the prowling snow leopards. Today, Sunbe's meeting goat herder Oyun Gebesh, who lives with her extended family in the remote village of Toshtbarg on the southwest tip of Mongolia. The family rely entirely on their animals for their survival. But due to the increasingly dry conditions, the herd is now roaming further to find food, deep into snow leopard territory. The family is increasingly worried about the threat of a snow leopard attack. Suddenly, there's a sound outside that almost certainly spells trouble. The cry of a goat in distress. All week, there have been rumors of a big cat prowling the area, and even grandmother scans the horizon for some clues as to what has caused the commotion. Sunbe speeds off in the direction of the noise, while Oyun takes a shortcut over a small ridge to the west. Within minutes, she finds a clue that stops her dead in her tracks. The unmistakable evidence of an attack. One of Oyun's precious goats has bled to death from a throat wound. Nobody is sure whether this is the work of a snow leopard or a hungry pack of wolves. The proof is at their feet. 
The fact that the carcass has been left to rot rather than eaten confirms that this time the wolf is the culprit. While other herders might have wrongly blamed the leopard, Chimge knows the difference. Either way, the outcome for Oyun and her family is the same. A dead goat is a painful economic blow. The carcass is inedible due to poisonous wolf saliva. There's only one thing left to do, comb its wool to sell at the market. Sunbe knows that educating people about the snow leopard's behavior is key to protecting the animal's future. It's why he spends so much time gathering information and tracking the snow leopard's movements. Today, he's setting up a motion detection camera to take snapshots of the big cats, whose fur patterns are as unique as a human fingerprint. Making sure he gets a perfect shot is essential. So Sunbe always goes through a last minute technical check. While the camera captures the cat's stealthy movements, Sunbe returns to his office to examine GPS data from tracking collars fitted to six leopards as part of a 15-year study of the South Gobi Desert. Finally, the results of the previous day's filming are in, and Sunbe is not disappointed. These snapshots are both breathtaking and incredibly rare. There are fewer than 4,000 snow leopards left in the wild. The Gobi boasts the second largest snow leopard population in the world, making ordinary Mongolians the animal's natural guardians. But it's hard persuading locals to protect the animals when they themselves have been victims of an attack. While snow leopards are often wrongly blamed for livestock deaths, there are occasions when the big cats do wreak havoc. Today, Sunbe is visiting one couple whose herd of goats only recently suffered a deadly nighttime visit. Sunbe knows that quizzing a witness to an attack can provide deep insights into the leopard's hunting prowess. For a beast so rarely seen by humans, every shred of information about the snow leopard's behavior is priceless. <laughs> For Dembresh and Togo, helping Sunbe is small consolation. The death of five adult goats means the couple has lost two months' income. Before he leaves, Sunbe makes a final check on how the couple are protecting their herd from further raids. Gorichi, then, three hundred Urugu, he did not go to the Arab Emirates. 
Nek sora tayon to ire to hon. Mororo. For Sunbe, the challenge of keeping the herders on side is easy compared to defending the leopard from the greatest threat of all, progress. This is the evidence of Mongolia's newest phenomenon. A runaway mining boom that is now seriously encroaching on the snow leopard's territory. These are core samples left on the site by a mining company that has moved onto richer deposits. With a rapid increase in mining companies flocking to the desert to exploit its underground wealth, the Mongolian government is eager to cash in on the gold rush while it lasts. It's issued dozens of mining licenses across Sunbe's study site. There's now a ban on mining in this region for the next seven years. Beyond that, the snow leopard's future remains unclear. Sunbe's discovery serves as a sharp reminder of the colossal challenges Mongolia must overcome to save this beautiful cat from disappearing forever. This reverence for wildlife is at the heart of what it means to live in the Gobi. With its ice-capped peaks, sweeping plains and breathtaking beauty, it's a place where people experience immense spiritual bonds with nature. One that they nurture from a very young age. 13-year-old Zen Dayush has always had a powerful, mystical calling. He lives with his family on the edge of the desert in the South Gobi capital of Dalanzagad. Even though today starts just like any other, it's a very special day for Send. It's the most important in the Buddhist calendar. Today is the festival of Mongolia's New Year an event for which Send and his fellow monks have been busily preparing for weeks. Sen's lifelong calling to become a Buddhist monk was signaled at the moment of his birth. <laughs> Using one of the most venerated Buddhist instruments, the conch shell, Zend calls pilgrims to join the holy festivities.
and they arrive in droves. This is the one day of the year when praying matters most, because every single prayer has the potential to multiply. Inside the temple, there are 14 lamas leading the religious ceremony. But this is just a fraction of the hordes of monks who would have lived here generations ago. For much of the 20th century, Mongolia was caught between two squabbling superpowers, China and Russia. Buddhism in Mongolia has a dark past. With the rise of communism in the 1920s, the Mongolian authorities came under pressure to mirror Lenin's violent anti-religious reforms. Monks were considered counter-revolutionaries, and by the late 1930s, Buddhism fell victim to a bloody purge. Up to 30,000 monks were killed, and 70,000 more exiled or jailed. Religious practice in Mongolia all but disappeared. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, everything changed. Now there's a big religious revival underway in the Gobi. These days, Mongolian Buddhism is moving with the times. Buddhists are embracing modernity, and the religion is flourishing. Today, more than half of Mongolians are practicing Buddhists. And Mongolia isn't just undergoing a cultural revolution. The whole of the Gobi is in a state of transformation. Urbanization is gathering pace, and people are abandoning their rural ways in the hope of a better life in the cities. In 2010 alone, following the effects of a ferocious winter, more than 20,000 destitute nomads relocated from their desert homes to the capital of Ulaanbaatar. But in deserting the land, people are also breaking the bonds that have enabled them to survive in this desert for so long. And if the trend continues, there is one creature who stands to lose everything. The number of native camels in Mongolia is in drastic decline, and while some manage to exist in the wild, most are domesticated and rely on humans for food and water. As this relationship changes, so too does the role of the animal in everyday life. <laughs> Today, many of Gobi's camels are more show ponies than workhorses. The faster and more beautiful the animal, the bigger the status symbol. 
And this is where the proudest owners come to show off their magnificent beasts. 800 kilometers south of the capital, on the snowy plain in Bulhun, the annual Thousand Camels Festival is in full swing. It's the nomadic equivalent of the Olympic Games, a chance to showcase the power and the agility of both animals and owners. Starting with the camel relay. Young, unbroken animals are brought into the ring, and it's the herder's challenge to tame them in every way. Before trying to mount the wild beast, they must first bind it and pull it to the ground. Then cut away its fur, which is plaited into a rein that the rider will use to show the camel who is master. The risk of being thrown and trampled is very real. The ultimate skill is one of final domination, saddling the beast with a packed down traditional gur and hay for the winter. It's a real spectator sport, and everybody has an opinion. The winning team is always the one with a whole lot of know-how and that little bit of luck. And today, Aditran's one of those who's come out on top. Owner of 60 camels, he's one of the wealthiest herders in the province. He sees the festival as an opportunity to both demonstrate the spectacular power of the animals and promote their plight. But like all the men here today, he has one big event on his mind. The 30-kilometer dash. The winner of this mad camel race across the snowy desert will steal the most coveted festival prize. As the jockeys jostle for position, there are other competitions underway in which the owners are the focus. Nomads are fiercely proud, so couples dress extravagantly in an effort to become this year's best-looking camel-owning duo. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the big hall, there's a nail-biting game of ankle bone shooting underway. In this ancient take on tiddlywinks, contestants flick animal bones towards a target 10 meters away. The spectators have a curious way of expressing their support, a unified chant that gets louder and higher the better the performance. Back outside, the racing camels are chomping at the bit. <laughs> As the seconds count down, an eager bunch of herders huddle to wager their hard-earned cash on what is, probably, their one and only bet of the year. With a long stretch of deep snow to navigate, every rider is dicing with death. Within minutes, the race breaks up as a few hopeful riders streak ahead of the main pack. These are the men who know exactly what they are here for today. Then, with one last whip from the winner, the camel race of the year 
is over. Some racers are disappointed. In old times, we had two cars. We had two cars. We had a car that was going to go to the next one. We had a car that was going to go to the next one. We had a car that was going to go to the next one. But where was I Ditzerin in the order of things? The race winner gets a brand new motorbike. The irony seemingly lost. And for all he's had to put up with, the camel gets a much needed lift home. Another festival has come to an end and people return to their lives. These are the people who've made a home in a desert that's changing faster than almost any place on Earth. Mongolia's first ever mining boom is gripping the nation. It carries promise of new future, but is cutting deep into the landscape. It's an unprecedented push for progress, with winners and losers. Standards of living are being transformed, Urban growth is advancing at breakneck speed, but all at the cost of an ancient way of life. Today, the destiny of the Gobi lies within the heart of its people. In the face of immense physical challenges, hope springs eternal. Even in the most untouched parts of the desert, resilience is strong. By holding fast to their faith, Perhaps the desert dwellers have the power to preserve the spellbinding beauty that is the Gobi.